65 kilos of red kangaroo versus five scientists, one four-wheel drive vehicle and two shots of Valium. That gives some indication of the tremendous strength of Australia's best known animal. It's hard to believe that a newborn kangaroo is about two centimeters long and weighs less than one gram. The mother ignores the newly born embryo, which is blind and has no rear legs or tail. With amazing independence, it struggles into its mother's pouch and locks on to one of the four milk nipples. It stays there for three whole months while it develops its physical features. By the time it's ready to release its permanent grip on the nipple, it's much more recognizable as a young kangaroo. Soon, it'll be able to have a look at its surroundings. What it discovers will depend on which of the 47 species of kangaroo it belongs to and what type of habitat it finds itself in. Australia is a huge continent, covering a wider area than the whole of Europe. At least one type of kangaroo is represented in almost every type of country, from the snow line to the desert. The largest of all kangaroos are the greys, 
Both the western and eastern greys tend to stick to temperate areas along the southern coasts. This tendency of the grey kangaroos to avoid extreme climatic conditions could explain the very long pouch life of the young, up to 11 months. The young of the common wallaroo or euro kangaroo will leave the pouch three months earlier at eight months. The euro frequents rocky hills with nearby surface water. It usually stays in the same area throughout its lifespan, even in times of drought, when many animals die. Grey and red kangaroos, on the other hand, will travel long distances in search of water. Even more specialised in habitat are the rock wallabies. These are black-footed rock wallabies. They're one of several species which live only in rocky areas, sometimes quite isolated like islands, and can be many kilometers apart. Beautiful, agile animals. This colony is in the McDonnell Range in Central Australia. Some kangaroos are very small. This little rufous hair wallaby, or mala, seldom grows taller than 35 centimetres. It's another animal which used to be quite common, but is now very rare. There are only three small colonies in the country. This animal comes from the Tanami Desert in Central Australia. It can survive without water and has a stomach specially adapted to digest food with a high content of plant fibre. Another small kangaroo is not common, and yet its population is quite dense in its major habitat, a tourist island off the port of Fremantle in Western Australia. It's the short-tailed wallaby, or quokka. Because it's so accessible, a great deal of research has been done on the quokka, and most animals on the island carry ear tags. They're very popular with the tourists. Surprisingly, there's been very little research on the big kangaroos. Only three centres are working seriously on kangaroo studies in Australia. One of them is the Arid Zone Research Centre at Fowler's Gap Station near the mining centre of Broken Hill in western New South Wales. Researchers from the university are analysing blood samples. This is part of a long-term project aimed at widening present knowledge of the kangaroo's biology and its impact on agriculture, a controversial issue with farmers. The movements and behaviour patterns of animals wearing radio transmitters are partly monitored by radio tracking stations. At the same time, visual confirmation of behaviour is very important.
an observation tower has been erected in a 40 hectare enclosure. Professor Terry Dawson is supervising a detailed study comparing the energy efficiency of kangaroos and sheep. What I'm primarily looking at just now is how much feed or how much energy the kangaroos and sheep take out of the environment. What we are getting from the radio receivers is actually heart rate. We use heart rate because it can be correlated with energy use, amount of feed. Now we're looking at these sheep and kangaroos uh, and what we're seeing is that the kangaroos appear to have quite a lower heart rate than the, the sheep. Uh, it's not the sort of stuff we would have been able to analyse without modern techniques but we can really then get a firm estimate of how much vegetation the kangaroos take out of the environment and how much the sheep take out. Uh, most of the graziers would say that kangaroos eat about three times as much as a sheep and the conservationists and preservationists uh, say that kangaroos eat a quarter as much as uh, sheep but nobody knows the answers but I think within the next few months we'll have a very firm idea. The graceful hopping of the kangaroo is a unique form of movement. No other animal in history, weighing over about five kilograms, has ever used hopping as a form of locomotion. At low speeds, it's a very inefficient way of moving, and the kangaroo doesn't use it. He just uses its forelegs like a pair of crutches, and swings the hind legs through, using the tail as an extra leg. But at speed, it's remarkably efficient, and after the initial two or three hops, it requires very little effort. It's as if the animal were jumping on a pogo stick. The energy as it comes down is stored in elastic tissues and is reused to send it up again. It's like bouncing a rubber ball. You don't have to move it all the time. You just need to expend a very little energy to keep it bouncing. It's an ideal way of moving in an arid country and it enables the kangaroo to travel tremendous distances in search of water with very little effort. A red kangaroo will think nothing of moving 20 kilometers to water and back again in a single night. The drinking habits of the kangaroo are extraordinary. A man would be in serious trouble in this country if he went a day without water. He might even die. But kangaroos are very tolerant to dehydration. They can exist for up to three weeks without water, losing up to 30% of their body weight with no apparent trouble. When they drink, they top this up again. Drinking solidly, they can put on 10 kilograms of body weight in half an hour and store away over 10 litres of water. Young kangaroos are commonly known as joeys. Although increasingly interested in feeding on the surrounding vegetation, joeys still return to the pouch for a supplement of fat-rich milk. Wherever a joey finds itself, security still centers around mother. Kangaroos are vegetarians, and the usefulness of the hand-like front paws, redundant while traveling at speed, is quite obvious. Different kangaroos prefer different shrubs and grasses. The water content of the vegetation enables kangaroos to survive in some of the harshest arid conditions in the world. Some island kangaroos definitely drink seawater, probably to increase their salt intake. Their digestions have become adapted to obtaining nourishment from seaweed. Most characteristics of kangaroo behavior relate to the need to keep cool and retain water. Consequently, the kangaroos are largely nocturnal. They rest in any available shade during the day and graze in the relative cool of the evening or early morning. The fur provides some insulation, while licking of the forepaws has a direct cooling effect.
The very large ears may well be a cooling device, rather like the rabbit-eared bandicoot, but they have another very important function. When a startled kangaroo appears to be staring at an intruder, it's not really staring at all, it's listening. Its ears are homing in on the sound, like a finely tuned stereo. It can't do this when it's hopping, so frequent stops are needed to update the oral information. Social groupings vary from species to species. Some kangaroos are essentially solitary. Others move around in groups of various sizes, from a couple of animals up to hundreds. When large social groups are established, tensions often build up and male animals strive for dominance. The boxing kangaroo is very much a reality, but Queensbury rules don't often apply. Fights are not always restricted to two animals. Until the arrival of white settlers, the kangaroo had few predators. Young may be taken from the air, but today there's a continuous danger to kangaroos from heavy road transport. Hundreds of them are run down at night after being bemused by headlamps of fast-moving vehicles. Ironically, this has produced a marked increase in the population of carrion eaters. Very few crows will go hungry in this part of the world. Very occasionally, an unwary animal may encounter Australia's largest predator, the saltwater crocodile. The dingo is a definite predator, but is rather an enigma. Farmers shoot dingoes to protect their sheep, thus protecting the kangaroo, which they also regard as a pest. Human beings, of course, are easily the greatest predators. The annual kangaroo cull of up to two million animals is the world's largest wildlife harvest. In such an uncertain environment, it's not surprising the kangaroo is a nervous animal. In extreme situations, a female burdened with pouched young may resort to dropping the joey as a distraction to pursuers. This apparently heartless behaviour is related to perhaps the most remarkable feature of the kangaroo. A large proportion of all kangaroos carrying young in the pouch have already mated again. The resulting pregnancy is halted at about the six to eight cell stage and held in suspended animation until the young leaves the pouch or is lost. This triggers some hormonal mechanism and the latent embryo immediately resumes its growth. When a kangaroo drops a joey, it may well be sacrificing one member of the family so that two others can survive. The alternative is possible death for all three. Equally remarkable is the period when a young at foot is suckling. If there's another young in the pouch, the kangaroo is able to produce two separate grades of milk appropriate to each joey's stage of development. Once orphaned, joeys are never accepted by other kangaroos and will certainly die. These ones are being reared by researchers at the Fowler's Gap station. To tag a kangaroo so its movements and behaviour can be monitored, first you have to catch it, and this is not simple. One method used at Fowler's Gap is rocket netting. Various animals take advantage of man-made water sources. Some drink during the day but kangaroos prefer the evening. It becomes a question of waiting patiently out of sight for a kangaroo to appear. Finally, a nervous kangaroo arrives and the trap is ready to be sprung. A 
At the crucial moment, a noisy crow interrupts proceedings. All the waiting has been in vain. There's still a chance for another attempt. In the gathering gloom, another kangaroo ventures in. And this time, it won't get away. He's going to have to tie it. Well, this bloody string's no good. He must go behind the net. You've got to tie that one to that. Oh, well. Right up, Cody. Oh, I've got one arm in there. You got him here? Yeah. Actually, I'm almost in the bank too. Stand there in the ball. Doing some more damage. Don't fall out, okay? Got a couple bags towards him. Not fine. Once its details have been measured and recorded, it can be released back into the wild. Its behaviour can then be monitored and will help towards a greater knowledge and understanding of Australia's best loved and best known animals. Now there's just time to catch a glimpse of the least known of all kangaroos and also the strangest. Lumholtz's tree kangaroo lives in a tiny area of tropical rainforest in northern Queensland. It's a fascinating animal, totally nocturnal and adapted to an arboreal existence because of its diet. It lives on numerous different kinds of fruit and various leaves. To maintain this diet, it has to climb trees because that's the only place where the food is found. So its physical features differ from most other kangaroos. It has powerful, massive forelimbs with strong curved claws and is the only member of the kangaroo family which can move its hind legs independently, essential for climbing up and down trees. It may look a little clumsy, but its adaptations are totally successful and its climbing is very efficient. The range of kangaroos is so great, we've only had a chance to look at a few of them. No matter how they're predated by man and dingo, the kangaroos have an astonishing resilience. There are still over 20 million kangaroos in Australia and figures indicate that despite the large number of reds and greys and euros taken by shooting and other predation, these are only a small percentage of the numbers lost in droughts. This is one euro which very nearly defeated the great dry arch enemy only to be foiled a few metres away from the life-giving water by a forked branch. In its weakened condition, it couldn't get free. It's a hard country.